It is 3 p.m. in New York, 7 in London, and 4 on a Friday afternoon here in Seoul. I'm Moon Gun Young. You're watching Arirang Korea's only global network. It looks like the president will take things into her own hands. President Park Geun-hye has made an appointment for the chair of a new reunification preparatory committee that's expected to be launched sometime in April, and it is the president herself. Senior Presidential Foreign Affairs Secretary Chu chul yi said Friday that President Park will chair the committee, which will be comprised of some 50 members from the government as well as the civil society. The committee, which was proposed by the president on the first anniversary of her term in office last month, will meet at least once every three months to set a direction for the reunification of the two Koreas and seek ways to prepare for that process. Meanwhile, President Park Geun-hye will embark on a week-long trip to the Netherlands and Germany on March 23rd. The presidential office of Cheung Wa-dae said earlier this Friday that the president will be attending the 2014 Nuclear Security Summit in The Hague from the 24th to the 25th. There, she will be giving an opening speech as the leader of the previous NSS host country. President Park will also hold summit talks with Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutter on the sidelines of the global event. She will then travel to Berlin to meet with both German Chancellor Angela Merkel and President Joachim Gauck. The Korean leader plans to focus her state visit there on not only strengthening bilateral ties with Germany, but also learning from the German experience of reunification. President Park has nominated a career judge to head the country's broadcasting and communications watchdog. Choi Song Jun, a senior judge at the Seoul High Court, was nominated to chair the Korea Communications Commission Friday. The term of the current chair, Lee Kyung Jae, ends on March 25th. Now, in his 28-year career, Choi has served as the president of the Chuncheon District Court and the chief judge at both the Seoul Central District Court and the Patent Court of Korea. In its nomination of Choi, the presidential office highlighted his leadership and rationality. It will request a parliamentary hearing for some time next week. A top U.S. military official says any new war on the Korean Peninsula would be incredibly difficult and dangerous. His comments came as another official warned the ballistic missile threat posed by North Korea to the mainland United States has developed from a theoretical consideration to a practical concern. Arirang's Kwon Soa reports. The United States has once again warned of the increasing threat posed by North Korea, saying a war on the Korean Peninsula, should it ever break out again, would be incredibly difficult and extremely dangerous. This according to U.S. Army Chief of Staff General Raymond Odierno when he was asked which part of the world would be the most dangerous to deploy U.S. troops in the case of future contingencies. Speaking at a forum at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, Odierno stressed his worry about North Korea's miscalculations and the importance of U.S. support to South Korea. The latest comments by another leading U.S. military figure show the U.S. is growing increasingly concerned by the ballistic missile threat posed by North Korea. At a Senate hearing Thursday, General Charles Jacoby, head of the Northern Command and North American Aerospace Defense Command, said that while threats to U.S. national security were becoming gradually more imperceptible, the U.S. military could make a confident assessment of where North Korea is in terms of ballistic missile capability. Tangible evidence of North Korean and Iranian ambitions confirms that a limited ballistic missile threat to the homeland has matured from a theoretical to a practical consideration. He added that his agencies were working with the Missile Defense Agency to deal with the potential proliferation of dangerous technologies to other states or terrorist groups. North Korea has developed and tested a number of short- and medium-range missiles, including a series of SCUD missile and short-range projectile firings in recent weeks. But analysts have generally discounted claims the regime has the capability to construct a miniature nuclear device for intercontinental ballistic missile delivery. Experts worry that if Pyongyang does possess such technology, the regime will pose a much greater security threat to South Korea, Japan and the United States. Kwon Soa, Arirang News.
When the latest news meets the latest business stories, we give you a bigger and better picture of the world. Business Today with Moon Gon Yong, every weekday, only on Arirang. Speaking of the Arab Peace on the Korean Peninsula, speaking of the annual national conference held in Korea, Korea's Prime Minister Park Geun-hye Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says there are no plans to revise the landmark apology Tokyo issued in 1993 to the so-called comfort women. But the sincerity of his remarks are unclear as they come just a day after one of his most trusted aides outright denied Japan's sexual enslavement of Korean women during World War II. Our foreign affairs correspondent Hwang Sung-hee reports. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says Japan will uphold a landmark apology issued to the victims of its wartime sexual enslavement. Speaking at a session of the House of Councillors Budget Committee on Friday, Abe said the Kono statement contains Tokyo's historic perception on the so-called comfort women issue. He added his administration has no plans to revise it, as declared earlier by his chief cabinet secretary Yoshihide Suga. The Kono statement, released in the name of then Chief Cabinet Secretary Yohai Kono in 1993, acknowledges and apologizes for Japan's forced sexual enslavement of roughly 200,000 women during the Second World War. The Japanese government had declared earlier this month that it would probe the accuracy of testimonies provided by Korean comfort women, which established the basis of the statement. The move had raised speculations Japan was attempting to backtrack on its apology. Abe, who has long called for a review, seemed to take a step back Friday, saying historical perceptions should not become a diplomatic issue, and said history studies should be left in the hands of experts. In Japan, more than 1,300 Japanese historians have signed a petition calling on their government to preserve the Kono statement as it is. Abe faced criticism both at home and abroad for denying his country's wartime crimes. The United States has been calling on Japan to mend ties with South Korea, indicating he may have been pressured to show a change in position. But while the Japanese leader may appear to have eased his right-wing stance, his comments come just a day after his top government spokesman said there was no evidence of Japan's forced recruitment of women. Hwang Sung-hee, Arirang News. The Malaysian government has denied that the plane that's been missing for days could have flown for four hours after it went off the radar. And a new report saying that the plane's communication systems may have been shut down manually gave rise to the possibility of a hijack attempt or a technical malfunction. Connie Kim has the latest. The Malaysian government has denied claims that a missing Malaysia Airlines plane could have flown for hours after it lost contact with air traffic controllers following reports that emerged Thursday. As far as Rolls-Royce and Boeing are concerned, those reports are inaccurate. Investigators said that the plane may have flown for about four hours after it disappeared from radar because a satellite picked up faint electronic pings from the aircraft after it went missing. There were reportedly about five to six pings detected, with the pings detected every hour. Still, officials say it is hard to know where the jet was headed and where it was before it went down. In a related development, there is also a new claim that the plane's communication systems were shut down systematically. Two U.S. officials told ABC News that the plane's two communication systems, the data reporting system and the transponder, were shut down at different times, indicating a third party may have intervened to shut them down. With a jetliner gone missing for seven days, U.S. officials are now widening their search for the aircraft to the Indian Ocean and are considering the possibility that the plane flew west after takeoff. Indian defense officials have decided to deploy ships, aircraft, and helicopters to the Bay of Bengal and the Andaman Sea to search for debris. The Korean government will also send 39 people and two military aircraft to Malaysia on Saturday to assist with the search. Malaysia Airlines Flight 370 took off from Kuala Lumpur on Saturday, but vanished from radar en route to Beijing. Connie Kim, Arirang News. One person was killed and over a dozen injured Thursday when rival demonstrators clashed in Ukraine's eastern city of Donetsk. Ukraine officials said the 22-year-old man died of a knife wound and the others are in hospital. 
The violence erupted as pro-Russia demonstrators clashed with crowds condemning Moscow's seizure of Crimea. And the death is the first since Russia's takeover of the autonomous region. Nearly 100 people have been killed since protests broke out in Ukraine last November over the ousted president's decision to back away from a trade deal with the European Union in favor of closer ties with Russia. Meanwhile, Washington warned Russia on Thursday that the U.S. and Europe will take serious steps if it annexes Crimea, which is to hold a referendum this weekend on rejoining Russia. Now, Korea's financial watchdog says that starting next month, financial institutions should let the public know all of their financial crimes worth more than 1 billion won, or roughly 930,000 U.S. dollars. The Financial Supervisory Service said Friday that the new measure is designed to prevent the commission of crimes by financial institutions. Now, prior to this, major local banks like Kungmin only had to disclose crimes worth over 93 million to the public. Now, we're going to talk about FTAs. Korea is also making headway on a free trade pact with China. A tenth round of free trade talks between Korea and China will kick off next Monday in Ilsan, northwest of Seoul. The two sides are expected to hold discussions on various areas, including products, services and investment. The talks are scheduled to run through next Friday. Negotiations for the bilateral FTA were launched in May 2012. China has been Korea's biggest trading partner since 2004. And speaking of FTA, Saturday tomorrow marks the two-year anniversary of the ratification of the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement. Data released by the Korean government on this Friday shows the deal has had a generally positive effect on the nation's trade figures. Our Nai Hung reports. The trade ministry says Korea's exports to the U.S. have increased by 10 percent since the Korea-U.S. free trade agreement took effect two years ago. Exports of industry goods benefiting from the FTA, such as automobile and petroleum products, saw a 15 percent increase over the past two years compared to two years prior to ratification. That's more than a double of Korea's overall exports over the same period. But imports from the U.S. shrank nearly 4 percent overall despite a 10 percent surge of American imported goods benefiting from the pact, like medicine and medical supplies. One area offsetting overall U.S. imports was agricultural products, the sore spot that caused much opposition from Korean farmers, delaying the ratification process in 2012. Compared to 2011, imports of American agricultural goods last year showed a 20 percent decrease, according to the ministry. A report released by the Korea International Trade Association on Friday says a gradual recovery in the world's largest economy will help boost Korean exports in the future. The report also advises Korean companies to focus on products that are increasingly in demand in the U.S. market, for example, biodiesel products and lighting equipment. At a forum held in Washington Thursday local time, U.S. lawmakers also positively evaluated the effects of the FTA, saying it has strengthened not only the two countries' economic ties, but also their political and military alliance. But reports say there were also critical voices from American civil organizations. Citing the decreased U.S. export figures to Korea, they say the deal has fallen far short of job promises and improvements in trade balances. Na hyun Arirang News. There is a link between sweets and the economy. It may be hard to believe, but there is. Korean cuisine is often defined by its hot, spicy dishes, but people in Korea also have quite the sweet tooth. It's that hankering for cakes, pastries and cookies that has more and more businesses bustling for their slice of the pie. Our Shin Semin reports. Chocolate cones filled with choco balls a pearly whipped cream cake with raspberries on top, and itty-bitty bite-sized candies. This is but a small size of the types of desserts that are literally selling like hotcakes in Seoul these days. At a department store in the capital, long lines form in front of this dessert shop as soon as it opens, and everyone is waiting for a taste of sweet bliss. 
Only those who are prepared to stand in line and wait at least half an hour will be then able to satisfy their sweet tooth. And this particular shop usually closes at around midday after all their products have sold out. I hear that this dessert is popular, which makes me want to stand in line and wait. I came out a little early so I could get a piece before the store runs out. These customers are hardly alone. Desserts are the latest food craze in Korea, ranging in price from four U.S. dollars all the way up to 50. Consumers open up their wallets all day long without hesitation. Sometimes I spend less on my meal and just get desserts because these are a little pricey compared to the size. I even replace my meal with desserts sometimes. Sales at this particular department store came in at nearly $84 million in 2013, surpassing sales of pre-made meals. Korea's leading dessert cafe franchise, which is owned by one of the nation's conglomerates, says its business has grown by 20 percent annually on average since it opened in 2002. Mom and pop stores are also getting in on the act. Experts say the rise in demand for desserts is partially due to the economic downturn as consumers crave sweet treats to lift their spirits in a sluggish economy. More are willing to spend extra on things they categorize as valuable or worthy enough to invest in, such as pieces of cake, while also demanding cheaper prices on the things we buy daily, for instance, green peppers and potatoes. As with the rapidly evolving market, the turnover rate for the department store's dessert shops is extremely high. The shops are on short leases that only last six to nine months, which puts more pressure on the industry to come up with the next popular dessert item. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Well, Korea is increasingly becoming an attractive destination for leading global technology companies keen on expanding their data centers. Microsoft, for one, has announced plans to build a data center in Korea, which will be by far the largest investment ever made in Korea by a global technology firm. But is this all good news? Well, joining me live on the line to give us some perspective is Dr. Kim byung ju the head of KLMP Consulting and, of course, our regular commentator on this program. Good afternoon to you, Dr. Kim. Good afternoon. So Microsoft and other global firms are now interested in setting up data centers here in Korea. Right, indeed. Uh, we were hearing initially, actually, uh, a, a story or speculation that uh, Japan's SoftBank was going to set up a, a data center in Kimhae area, a city adjacent, adjacent to uh, Busan. And there are a lot of cons, uh, you know, speculations whether this is true or not. But recently, more recently, we were hearing Microsoft, actually, as you said, uh, talking about setting up a data center uh, here in Korea. Particularly, uh, according to the reports, it will be uh, within the Busan area. And what they are talking about is setting up this center. There will be about 165 thousand square meter size. Uh, this is a very considerably large size. And uh, they're saying, we are being told that they're trying to uh, negotiate uh, conditions with the city uh, of Busan Metropolitan Government about tax benefits and, and the land prices and so on. And they're saying, actually, uh, Microsoft is looking for a Korean construction company to build this data center and they are hoping to finalize uh, which among the Korean construction companies will be building this by sometime May. And uh, it's being reported that the overall time for construction will take about 24 or 30 uh, months. And all in total, according to the reports we are hearing, it will be about 5 trillion won investment by Microsoft in Korea. Now, Dr. Kim, uh, the data centers we're talking about are um, warehouse-style storage spaces filled with uh, internet servers, if I'm not um, wrong. How can such a facility cost five trillion won? That's nearly five billion U.S. dollars to build. Right. right. That's a key question that a lot of people seem to be having in mind uh, these days because uh, uh, we have uh, previous cases where we can compare this, uh, you know, uh, 
the argument whether that will be practical or not, as you exactly as you have exactly pointed out. For example, one of Korea's giant, uh, you know, internet service provider, Naver, has its data center in the Chuncheon area, and altogether that size is about one third of what uh, Microsoft is talking about. It's smaller size, but still uh, that, and also KT's Korea, uh, KT's. Uh, IDC uh, Internet Data Center in Mokdong area in Seoul, they are about the uh, cost of about 150 billion won only, not trillion uh, units. And the, there is a Uyuang City Data Center also, which costed about uh, twice as much, 300 billion won. So uh, experts are saying data centers usually cost about uh, somewhere between, at most, about 200 billion or 300 billion. So it's very difficult to imagine how Microsoft will be investing, uh, you know, five trillion won here in Korea in the form of, uh, you know, data center. Uh, taking another example, IBM. IBM is busy setting up their, um, you know, global uh, cloud, uh, cloud computing centers around the world. Fifteen of them all together around the world, and they're talking about uh, 1.2 billion U.S. dollars, which is about 1.3 trillion won. So they're saying, of course, the land price in Busan is not cheap, uh, but considering all those and or, or even uh, data, uh, the equipment purchasing, like servers and other equipments and stuff, even if they're all purchased here in Korea, it's difficult, they say, to come up with five trillion one figure. So I think the speculation probably will continue on. Right. Um, I understand that the low cost of electricity is the main attraction for global Internet giants that considering Korea as a data center site, right? Right, exactly. That is the key reason they say. But of course, we have to recognize that overall uh, internet infrastructure here uh, allows Korea uh, to be a, a country where you can expect one of the fastest internet service. That's a critical factor here. And also another critical factor, oh, at least with regard to SoftBank's case, a uh, Japanese company, is uh, you know these global uh, internet uh, businesses are looking for a country where you can expect least effect from natural disasters and so on. So we don't have as many earthquakes, if none, uh, almost close to none, and uh, typhoon and like all these natural disasters. We are pretty safe. So those are attractions. But in addition, as you said, the cheap uh, electricity bill itself is a main attraction. They're saying in comparison with Japan and Germany or France, uh, Korea's industrial use electricity, uh, the price is about like a, a 40 to 60 percent. So definitely that is the uh, one of the key factors here. Right. But of course, uh, Korea is not uh, completely uh, free from um, earthquake shocks uh, these days. Just earlier <laughs> today, it was felt in Busan uh, by a, uh, an earthquake in Japan. Now, uh, the low electricity prices are what's uh, given us uh, this um, electricity shortage problem that we, we get every year. Mm -hmm. Now, for that reason, data centers uh, that consume huge amounts of electricity right. may not be such good news for Korea. What do you think? That is a key concern here because the electricity itself, because it's too cheap, uh, you know, we have a uh, shortage problem here. And Korean business communities seem to be already talking about these data centers coming in and take up uh, much of the, uh, actually they do consume, as you said, a lot of electricity. And, and they don't want to have that electricity, scarce electricity being shared with uh, other companies additionally coming in, looks like. So indeed, it's funny that this utility is becoming sort of like in our own thoughts in looking at this becoming a scarce uh, resources. And, and there is a tension, I think, uh, you know, in the business community here. Now, uh, job creation, and that's a really important issue here. But mm. I would imagine that data centers that do not employ a lot of people. That's another key point. Yes, I'm glad you're mentioning that because, you know, jo uh, the data center is not a factory where a lot of uh, no, large number of workers uh, work inside. It's usually service all you see inside the uh, f facility and air conditioning going on. And you don't really expect people walking around there as often. So job creation is a key these days in Korean government and Korean society and Korean business communities always looking for ways to create jobs. But they say data center, not only they uh, consume a lot of electricity, which is getting scarce in Korea, but also they're not going to create much jobs. And, and with uh, all this facility using a lot of electricity and also uh, using uh, air conditioning and, and so on, that could actually compromise uh, environment as well. So looks like what sounded like a good, great idea as a foreign investment here is turning to become a very controversial issue here. 
All right, that remains to be seen. Dr. Kim byung the head of KLMP Consulting and our commentator on this Business Today program, thank you for speaking with us today, and we'll see you back here in the studio on Monday. Okay. And time now to get a check on the weather forecast. And for that, let's go over to our Michelle at the Weather Center. Michelle, happy Friday to you. Happy Friday, Kanyang. The weather seems to have turned around, but it's kind of too chilly to say it's spring. Right. So um, is this spring weather going to be ahead of us in the coming days? Well, it looks like the weather is going to keep warming up throughout the weekend. However, today we have a chilly and bright day which uh, ahead of us with a highs of up to 10 degrees with a, a nice way to end of the week. Now, but please keep in mind that there is huge temperature gaps between the mornings and nights. Now, going over to our readings, Seoul, will, um, actually the satellite you're looking at is uh, it's slightly cloudy nationwide. However, Chungcheong, the province and provinces down south and exact some showers on and off throughout the day. Now, the temperature at Seoul will top out at 10 in the afternoon. The southern cities such as Gwangju and Busan will get up to 7 and 9 degrees respectively. Now, moving over to other regions, Jeju Island can expect a cloudy day with a high of 9. Dokdo will get up to 4, while Mangkumgang tops down to minus 4. Well, that's all for now. I'm Michelle Park and back to you, Kanyang. Thank you, Michelle, for that. And that's all from me at this hour. Thank you for watching. I'll see you back here in less than two hours' time on Early Edition at 6.